Hello everyone, my name is Paul Moulton. I'd like to welcome you to a series of five lectures covering the actuarial chain ladder method. Why so many? Lots of other people cover this in one short video. However, the chain ladder method is a very extensively used general insurance technique, so there's a lot to know. And I'd really like to share my experiences of using this technique pretty much every day for the last 25 years, which is a lot more exciting than it sounds. Um, and just to also get into you right from the start, there's a huge difference between just running a chain ladder model, anyone can pretty much pick up and do it, the maths are not too tricky, and actually building a really predictive model. So if you stick with me, I guarantee at the end of these five lectures you'll be much more knowledgeable, actually much more comfortable building this model, and much more um, proactive when you do that, and getting much better results out at the end of it. So before I get started, just to let you know, there's comments below this video. I'd really love to hear what you make of it, what's good, what's bad, what I can improve in future videos, what you'd like to hear about in future videos. If you like what I've done, please support me by clicking like. And if you click subscribe, you'll be the one of the first to hear about the new videos in this series. So without further ado, let's go and open up the first exhibit. So what we've got here is the policy life cycle. Now I'm really starting at the beginning here, so we're not going to go and open up a spreadsheet, we're not going to start running a model, we're going to really think about what we're trying to do from the start. It's a really good mindset to get into before you do any actuarial modelling, not just the chain ladder, but anything. If you don't think about what you're doing, particularly dangerous if you're working somewhere and you're repeating some work someone's already done, if you just jump in and, and start repeating the same analysis that's been done in the past, you can get yourself into some really bad places. You need to think about the model. This is what we're trying to do. This is the policy license. This is what we'll be trying to model using the chain ladder method. So you need to think about it. If you don't, it's going to be really obvious to whoever's reviewing your work. I know personally, when people give me work, I can see straight away if they've just literally turned the handle or whether they've really thought about this whole process because Insurance companies are not static, they're changing from year to year. The environment we operate in is changing from year to year. You need to be aware of what's happening so you can build a really predictive model that's really useful and powerful for the business. So here's the complete policy life cycle. And let's jump into a Zoom version so we can go through it step by step. So we start at the left and we go step by step through this life cycle. So the first thing that happens obviously is that the customer comes to the insurer and purchases the policy. Now, I appreciate that individual personal customers and insurers is not the only way this works, but I'm just gonna use customer and insurer interchangeably um, throughout this lecture in, in place of, uh, could be a business buying the um, policy, it could be even an insurer buying the policy from a reinsurer or from a retrocessionaire. We're just going to use customer insurer here just for simplicity. So it's interesting just to think about how insurance works just from the start. So normally a company will deliver the good or service and then provide an invoice and then get the money. Or maybe it literally exactly the same time they provide the good or service, they get the money. But in insurance it's very different. People pay up front and then at some point in the future, and it could be many years, um, or maybe not at all if, if there's no claim, the, the insurer then actually has to pay for that service that they provided. And this means we can't just take this cash in and pocket it and go, great, we've made lots of money this year. You need to hold back a, pol uh, a portion of the premium income to pay for future claims. You need to be aware of when those claims are going to be paid so you've got liquid assets held at the right duration. And you need to be very aware of what's happening with money coming in and the money that's going to be coming out. If you've got a good reserving function, then it really works really well. You very quickly get a feeling for how profitable the business you're writing is. You can feed that back to underwriting and pricing teams so they know how profitable the business is. They can either try and grow in areas that are profitable or they can take remediation action in areas that aren't so profitable. And so you've got this nice virtuous circle going. Conversely, if you've got a bad reserving function, then you won't be estimating 
the amount of money you need to hold well so you could end up short of cash and likely you'll be writing business which isn't as profitable because you haven't got that feedback. The underwriting team think it's profitable because your reserving isn't accurate and they're writing more and more this business and then eventually it all comes together and you get lots more claims than you expect to and you don't have the cash to pay for it. There was a study done by a Best a few years back which looked into the failures of insurance companies and the number one cause of failure of an insurance company was inadequate reserving. So you need to get that reserving right. The second most common, about 20%, was inadequate pricing. And as we just discussed, the reserving is driving the pricing. So when you think about it, really, reserving is the bedrock of the whole insurance operation. Don't ever let anyone tell you that reserving is boring or easy or unimportant. It's the core activity for the whole operation of an insurance company. OK, so the customers purchase the policy. And what does the insurer do? First thing it does is open a policy file. So this policy file is going to be an electronic record and it's going to have various details in it. So it's going to have details of the coverage. When does the policy coverage period start and end? Any deductibles, accesses, limits, any additional coverage options? It's going to tell you about the risk itself. So the class of business, the subclass, location, the channel that the business was sourced from. So was it a broker or direct or some other means? It might have some risk code information. And it's also going to tell you information about the policyholder themselves. So if it's a commercial policy, maybe it's talking about the size of the business. If it's an individual car insurance policy, maybe details about the type of car, previous loss history. And it's really important to be aware that this information on the policies being written is so important because the type of policies written by an insurer can vary a lot from year to year. And as the actuary, it's your duty to be fully aware of how these policies are changing over time and allow for it in any actual modelling that you're undertaking. So once we've got that details, the coverage period can start, and actually it doesn't always start immediately. So some policies are, are bought way ahead um, of the coverage period, but oftentimes, say a car insurance or a home policy, you tend to buy it very quick, very soon before the, uh, the coverage is going to start. And that coverage period where you're covering um, claims Generally, in, in um, general insurance, it's, it's annual, but there are other types of policies which last a lot longer. Construction policies, in particular, tend to be extremely long. Um, so you need to be aware of how those coverage periods are changing over time. So during the coverage period, there's two things that can happen. So either you get no insured event, which means that that policy is likely to run clean, or you get an insured event or possibly more than one insured event. And it's interesting to think about what's the right level of, of um, claims to come through, what's the right frequency of claims to come through on the, on the policies you're writing. And actually, if you're underwriting correctly, there's no right or wrong answer to that question. And in fact, you may think that having a high frequency is bad, but actually a low frequency can be equally bad. So if you're writing insurance which is not being claimed on, is that really going to help you to, to sell that business, you know, people are going to think it's a viable insurance coverage if they never make a claim on it. Um, and similarly, you could get into issues with um, the regulators if your, your policies are not looking like they're good value for money, you're not treating customers fairly. I've just mentioned frequency there, and it's a really important insurance term that you should be aware of. Um, and frequency simply relates to the number of claims that have occurred, maybe on a policy or on a cohort of policies or a class of business or the insurance company as a whole, divided by some exposure term. Exposure itself is another common term and that can take many forms. So at its most basic, it would just be a simple count of the number of policies. Um, it may be related to the risk, so looking at turnover or payroll, um, or it could be an even better thing like a risk index. So um, that's something you can get in a better insurance companies, an index over time of the risk of business they're taking on, and you can relate things back to that. And I think it's really important from the start to be aware that the, the, the answers, the ultimate claims, the ultimate amounts that come out of your model are meaningless unless you're putting them into context. And exposure is one of the really best ways to, to bring that context. So what is the, the ultimate coming out of your model relative to some exposure? So let's say an insured event does occur, then the customer has a decision to make. So the customer is going to think, do I want to claim or do I not? And you may say, well, obviously they're going to claim, but actually there are a number of cases when they won't claim. So 
the customer may look at the insurance terms and decide that actually maybe it's not a valid claim. Um, the customer may well have other insurance which covers that claim, so they may go to that. Or they may just be interested in maintaining their reputation as a, as a low claim um, policy holder. Um, you have no claims discount in motor insurance, for example, and they may well just be thinking that this very small claim is, isn't worth claiming. So there may be cases when um, the level of claiming claims coming into the insurance company um, varies. And actually, um, the staff of an insurance company, so whether it's um, very hard or soft on uh, borderline claims, or it's hard or soft on, on how much it pays out, can have an influence on the customer claim rate. So it's something you would want to be aware of, but obviously it's hard to know because you don't know about the claims that don't come in. Uh, however, you may well spot increases in the number of claims you do get. And that could maybe be indicative of um, some underlying change in the customer's mindset or in the approach um, to, to dealing with claims in, in the insurer you're looking at. Okay, so let's say the customer has decided that it's a valid claim and they'd like to make a claim, so they will then report that. And actually, um, there can be a lack at this point. So although you may feel like people would have an event and they'd immediately want to to get indemnified for that. It may be the case they don't actually know that there's an insured event. Um, or it may be that they um, want to see how the damage turns out. So it could be someone who's injured in an accident and they want to actually just see, go to get some doctor's opinions on, on the injury before they decide whether or not to make a claim. Um, in many countries, you have something called a limitation period typically three to five years, which sets the maximum time between a customer being aware of the insured event and then making the claim. So there is some limit on that, um, but you know a lot of it is in, is in the gift of the customer. And a lot of, like I say, a lot of the time the customer just wants to get indemnified and there may be delays um, that you need to think about. Similarly, if you sold the business for a broker, then the policy holder of the customer may go to the broker first, who will then um, do some initial work before then passing the claim on to the insurer. So you can have a delay if you're writing more brokerage business than direct. Um, and in fact, some brokers um, may well be um, reporting claims to the insurer through what's called a border row, so a claim listing that comes maybe every month or every quarter. And again, that can bring in delays and also limit the amount of information that comes to the broker. So you need to be aware in certain areas of insurance, whether or not you've got lots of brokerage business or, or not. Um, and one other way things can be slowed down is uh, for big commercial risks, whether it's very big, some insured, very big potential losses, um, it is quite often the case that the risk is spread across a number of insurers, and they tend to be a lead insurer and then a number of follow insurers. So if you're the lead, you would get the information very quickly. Um, in detail, if you're a follow insurer, you may have a delay, you may have limited information coming through to you and you're, you're meant to rely on the lead insurer. So again, you need to be aware, um, are you a follower, are you a leader, is that relationship changing because that will have an impact on how long it takes for the claim comes through to you. Okay, so you've got the, the claim in and then the first thing the insurer does at that point is to open a claim farm. So this is contain details which help you to link the claim back to the relevant policy. As we discussed, some policies will have no claims, some will have many. Um, so you'll have a unique claim number, um, a unique policy number, so you can link these things back together. You'll also have specific details about that claim. So when did the accident happen? When was it reported? Uh, what was the peril that caused it? Any other information that may be useful um, for underwriters, claims handlers, actuaries, etc. And then a very, very key part of this is going to be the financial information. So um, what's the open closed status of the claim? So when it comes in here, it's going to immediately go to open. Um, what are the paid and outstanding amounts on this um, claim? So again, to start with, the paid is going to be zero, but potentially once we've gone through the process, there will be some paid amounts on this claim. Um, and also what are the outstanding claim amounts? Um, so. It's also worth bearing in mind that the information on this claim will change over time, not just as it goes through here, but just over time more information may be received. And so it's very important to have the history of the financial information on any claim. And ideally this should be saved in an individual transaction database, which is we'll talk about at another 
video is going to be a really useful source of information for you as an actuary when you're building this model and, and understanding the results of it. In many situations, the insurer will have some kind of standard case reserving policy. So as soon as the claim comes in, it will put an immediate automatic estimate of how much it thinks that claim will be based on some key factors, maybe accident day, class of business, subclass, peril, etc. Um, and these standard case reserving policies can change and you need to be aware of that because it's going to have an immediate impact on lots and lots of claims. As soon as they come in the door, this policy is going to be enacted. And so as the actually you need to be cognizant of that process and how it may have evolved over time. Okay, so the claims come in, then we go to the assessment stage. So the claim will be assessed by skilled teams. So generally this is going to be individuals, although I do appreciate there is a bit of a move towards machine learning to, to do some of this assessment stage. Um, and this can be a team internal or external to insure. And um, depending on the class of business and the size of the claim, there may be different processes that go through. They're going to go through two steps. So the first thing they're going to do is say, is the claim valid or not? So is the claim within the coverage period? Is the claim within the terms and conditions? Um, is there any hint of fraud? Anything else like that to decide whether or not the claim is valid or invalid. And um, again, there may be different approaches. So there may be a hard touch or a soft touch, or there may be um, different, different pockets of claims handlers who do things in a different way. And you need to be aware of that. Um, and then they're also, once they've decided whether a claim is valid or not, they're going to put in a, a, a considered case estimate on this claim. So we have the standard case estimate here. Once it's been assessed, um, you're going to get a considered case estimate, which is going to look at all the facts um, in more detail and, and put a, a more reasonable sort of generally best estimate, but it might not necessarily be um, on that claim. And again, you need to be cognizant of that considered case estimate process. So it, does the insurer have a policy where it looks to put a best estimate on? Does it look to be prudent? Does it look to be optimistic? Because that's going to have a big impact on the model that you're running. Um, the quantum of the claim can be important because, like I say, it could go to different teams. Um, it may well be the case that a very simple claim may not um, go much beyond the standard case reserve. It may stay on the case reserve for its whole life, whereas a more complicated claim may need a lot more assessment. And actually, that could equally cause a delay where it stays on the standard case estimate because you need to get a lot of information before you can put a good a good number on, on the case estimate. Okay, so if, the, if that team decide the claim is invalid, um, they're saying we don't think it's covered, the customer has a choice, they can accept that. Um, it's not a claim, in which case um, nothing gets paid, the claim gets um, set as closed and uh, we move on, uh, or it may be that the customer disputes that and wants to um, argue the case that the claim is actually valid in, in their view, uh, in which case it will go here, uh, or it may be that the claim is deemed not invalid. And that doesn't mean necessarily that uh, everything's accepted, but we think it's within the coverage period, we think it's within the terms and conditions um, of the policy, um, and therefore um, the insurer then has a choice. So it can either say, okay, we accept the claim, we accept it's valid, we'll pay it out the amount you claimed, in which case you pay some money out, you set it at close, the case reserves will come down to zero. So at this point you've got um, closed equals reported equals one, and you've got paid equals incurred um, equals whatever the amount of the claim is. Um, or it may be that the insurer at this point goes into dispute because it may say the claim is valid, uh, but it may be um, disputing the quantum of that claim. It's also worth noting that along this stage there can be partial payments, so it may be court fees or it may be um, a claim that can be split up into a number of parts and some can be paid uh, but others need to be disputed. So you need to be aware that there may be a trickle of payments um, coming through over time so necessarily a, a nothing paid and then suddenly everything paid status. So if is disputed, that means that there's maybe a dispute over validity or the amount. Um, and again, this is um, something which is going to add time and cost to the policy life cycle. Um, and the insurer's attitude policy towards setting and disputing claims is going to be a key part here of understanding how many claims are just going to get paid quickly and how many claims are going to go into this longer, more costly process. So, um, so at the point here, 
if the dispute is happening, then the claim will be reassessed by the same teams, um, looking at the extra information that's come in through this process um, and anything else that they're aware of to help them put an even better considered case estimate on these claims. It may be that the, the considered case estimates are relatively low here because they're expecting um, a lot of the simple claims to be settled and then once they get here, generally they're they realise it's a more serious claim and they need to put some, some more money on it um, in the case estimates. Um, once you've got here, then there's probably three ways. I've only got two arrows here, but two of them are covered on, under here. So the first one is the customer withdraws the claim. So the customer um, was arguing about validity, but you know we've, we've had another look at it and we really don't think it is. And we've evidenced that to the, to the customer and therefore the customer withdraws the claim. Um, but if it's down to quantum, or some path of validity, then you may well go into either mediation or, or a court case. Um, and so what can happen here is um, there's various points in time when the claim could end up being settled. So um, there may be uh, various discussions going on at this point and the insurer and the customer come to an agreement, um, either directly just between them or during a mediation process or maybe a court case has started, but both parties don't really want to get, get caught up in that. And so um, a settlement happens, agreed between the parties before the, the court decides. Um, or it may be that the, the court um, has to go through the whole process and has to make a decision. And they're the one who decide who wins the case and what the quantum is. So we need to be aware that court cases, they take a long time, has delays, add fees, legal costs to the claim. So generally only the bigger claims are going to go down this route. So this can drive some quite big differences in the policy life cycle for big and small claims. So as an actuary, you may need to think, well, do I need to look at big and small claims separately um, in some way because I don't want to get um, confounded by looking at some claims that go down this quick route and some claims which go down this, this long route. It may be better to, to look at things separately, large and small. Um, so if there's no... Um, if there's no appeal, then we may have a decision, so the customer loses the case, um, and again, um, the claim closes, and potentially you paid something along here, but anything that was open here doesn't get paid, so the pay leak was incurred. Or the customer wins the case, in which case the insurer pays out the amount they're, they're ordered to, um, and again, the claim gets closed, the pay leak was incurred because the case estimates are all set to zero because the claim's closed. There could be an appeal judgment, obviously, um, at this point, uh, which again adds more time, more more delays. So again, the more complex claims, um, you need to be aware they could have this extra phase, which can take even longer. Um, but generally at that point, uh, once you've got here, for the customer, um, the journey is over. So the customer has got, got what's fair, um, hopefully. Um, but there may well still be an extra phase for, for the insurer itself. So the insurer having um, settled the claim, has the opportunity to claim money back from potentially three different parties. So the first and the most obvious one is looking for salvage. Um, so for example, if you uh, this is a car insurance claim and um, the car was a write-off, a total loss, then the insurer has the ability to, to sell that. They, they essentially own that car, the, the total loss car, and they can then sell that for scrap and receive some money back. Um, it may well be that um, there's another liable party. So we said back here that the customer might not claim because there's a liable party. Um, but it may be the case that um, the insurer here does pay the claim and then seeks to get some recompense from any other parties who, who may have some some kind of liability towards this. It may be this is the main insurer and there's, there's some other parties who have some sort of um, other liability that, that can be called upon. Um, and lastly, there may well be um, reinsurance. So particularly with the large claims, companies quite often buy what's called excess loss reinsurance, which covers them for the part of any claim which go particularly big, so over 250k, half a million, a million, whatever it might be. So the, the insurer would go to the reinsurer and seek to recover on that reinsurance. Um, and again, you need to be aware of what kind of policies are likely to have these various different types of final recoveries. Um, it's worth talking about war policies. They're not particularly common. You may not come across them, but if you do, they're very important to think about this, this salvage um, 
opportunity because, for instance, in war it may be that there was an invasion and there was damage which was then claimed by the customer, but then after the war is over, the insurer can get in there and they can find the property and they can recover a certain amount. So war is a particular class of business where you get big savings late, late in the day because you get these huge salvage um, recoveries. So that is the policy life cycle step by step. It's really important to understand um, that this is what's happening. This is what you're trying to model in the chain ladder and, and any other um, reserving technique. Um, so we'll be referring back to this in some future lectures. Um, so please do please do bear this in mind. Have a, have a think about this when you're doing any reserving. If you're really thinking about things like this, you're going to be a much more um, useful hatchery. You're going to build much more insightful models and hopefully much more predictive models as well. That was all I wanted to say for today. So thank you very much for joining me. Um, there will be video two or five coming out shortly. Um, so please like to let me know um, whether this was useful. Please subscribe and you'll get um, told as soon as possible that when video two has come out. And please also leave me some comments. I'm very interested to hear um, what you've made of this video, what was useful, what you'd like to hear more about, um, about the chain ladder or about any other actuarial methods. I've, I've got 25 years of experience. I'm very keen to, to share that with people. So, so I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you very much.